Hey, this is Brant from TradeGuild.net and Wolf on Wall Street. It is February the 8th, and it's time for a video. There's been a um, viral campaign going around uh, regarding the market. A little cartoon, a couple bears. Buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip. And uh, you can't argue with it. You know, we've had a, um, a strong run up here. But right now, it's time to be very cautious. Um, we're in a period, I think, where the Fed has created its newest bubble. The Fed is just one bubble after another. They kill one bubble and they create another bubble. And uh, I think we're getting very close to being in that stage where we're looking at another bubble. Uh, you may have heard of the uh, permanent market operations that are uh, headed up by the New York Fed, also called POMO, P-O-M-O. And uh, they've shown a high degree of correlation uh, to the market melt-up, the rise in the market, uh, as primary dealers are just get flush with cash. Okay, they uh, they enter the market with that cash and they bid up these high PE stocks and these high beta stocks. The primary dealers are basically taking issuances from the treasury. They're holding them in some cases for less than a couple of weeks, and then they're flipping them to the to the Fed. And the Fed is doing exactly what it said, uh, what Ben Bernanke said under sworn uh, testimony in front of Congress he wouldn't do. He said he would not monetize the debt, and that's exactly what they're doing. And in uh, return for making billions of dollars in commissions and spreads, these primary dealers are going out and taking that money and they're, uh, they're putting it into the market. And that's why we're seeing this continual melt-up in the market, and it's leading to a very dangerous situation. But generally speaking, if you look at, uh, you can go to the New York Fed uh, website on a uh, POMO day, which is almost every day, and look at the uh, submitted uh, to accepted ratio and just divide that. And uh, the median is typically about 4.1 times. If it's over 4.1 times, um, generally the, the uh, primary dealers aren't going to have a whole lot of cash uh, from that operation. But if it's under then uh, you see just uh, this melt up in the market and we've used 3C during the day which detects accumulation distribution. We've actually seen the accumulation occurring and uh, you can actually see them uh, doing it before the market actually heads up. So that's something you want to keep an eye on is the uh, the POMO days and what the submitted to accepted ratio is and uh, you know it's just really a travesty. It's it, it's a tax. It's a burden on all Americans uh, because there's billions of dollars going to these primary dealers for absolutely no value whatsoever. They get these treasuries from the Treasury Department. In some cases, they don't even hold them two weeks. They have almost no risk, and they sell them at a markup to the Fed, and the Fed effectively monetizes the debt, and uh, they keep this image going of um, the market being strong. They think that that's going to, or, or their excuse is that that's going to uh, lead to consumer confidence and consumers are going to spend. But very few consumers right now have money in the market. Money's been flowing out of the market for seven, eight months consecutively. Uh, insiders consecutively have been selling at huge ratios of uh, triple digits to one. So five, six, seven, eight hundred, sometimes a thousand uh, insider transaction sales to every one buy and this has been going on for a long long time so they they know something okay so we, we have a stock market but there's also a market of stocks all right and it's very easy to manipulate the stock market you take a stock like apple which uh, is a component in the nasdaq 100 and uh, while I don't know what the exact weighting of Apple is. You have to pay the NASDAQ $10,000 for that kind of information. It's estimated to be about 20% of the NASDAQ 100. So you buy Apple and you've got uh, a huge, huge move in the NASDAQ 100. The equivalent, Apple's equivalent, is about the same as the 50 bottom NASDAQ stocks. So you take the 50 bottom NASDAQ stocks and they have about the same worth as Apple. So if Apple's up, if we had 51 stocks in the NASDAQ 100 and Apple is up 1.1% and the other 50 were down 1%, we'd have the NASDAQ 100 up for the day. So that's how they do it. They're buying these heavily weighted stocks. 
and they're forcing the uh, the index and the averages higher. But there's a lot of stocks in the market that aren't looking so good. I'm going to show you a couple. Let's take a look here. Google, it's not hitting the new highs like the market. It doesn't look too bad, but it's not hitting the new highs like the market. Uh, here's Amazon. Let me zoom in a little bit which has recently seen some trouble here in the market, breaking down below the 50-day moving average. Uh, McDonald's, and I think um, some of these, like McDonald's, you know, because they have worldwide exposure, they're multinationals, um, I think they're getting hit harder than some of the others. Another example, that would be Coke over here. Uh, how about Cisco Systems? Cisco Systems, not looking good at all. Um, Intel. There's Intel, not looking good. Bank of America, not uh, looking too hot there. It's not following the market. Um, 3M, there's another one, a big market leader, having some trouble there. Uh, Procter & Gamble, here's another multinational. And, of course, they're seeing some uh, recent trouble there below that 50-day moving average. Walmart is another example. These are big stocks. Um, Microsoft. And we're seeing the market hit new highs, and, and these stocks aren't following. Um, AT&T is another example. How about uh, Merck? There's one for you. Johnson & Johnson, not looking very hot. Uh, Kraft, not looking so hot. Another multinational, Coke, not looking so great. Um, I could go on and on and on. Um, in biotechs here, Celgene, not looking good. Um, Expedia. And this was a darling for a while, market darling. Uh, Amgen. Tiva Pharmaceuticals. Yahoo. Flex. Sandisk. Bristol Myers Squibb. How about Dell? Business? How about Staples? Pepsi? Another multinational. Merck and Drugs? Looking pretty horrible. Best Buy? You know what's happened with them? They got wiped out. And uh, Restaurant Cisco there? Not looking good. So. There's a, a lot of stocks in the market that are not um, looking good like the averages are. And like I said, the averages are easily manipulated. Uh, this is just the Fed's law of unintended consequences. Um, this bubble's been driving up commodity prices, causing hot money flows that are hitting emerging markets uh, particularly hard. Um, I think in a way you could say the Fed's number one export right now is inflation. Let's take a look at the SP500 and just like take a look at QE, quantitative easing. So back here, you know, here's the meltdown in 2008 of the market. Fed announces QE1. At QE1, they announced uh, $600 billion. And then in March, pretty much at the market bottom, they upped that to um, $1.7 trillion. Okay, so that gave the market a lot of support. You can see when QE ends, the market dips. So there's obviously a correlation there. Correlation has become a lot stronger, I think, in QE2. Here's where QE2 was announced. If you take a look at just um, bull market corrections over here, we hit the 50-day, hit the 50-day here, hit the 50-day here, hit the 50-day here. Now in QE2, we've had one bull market correction. If we kind of just go back and just take a look at the bull market that ran, Okay, and this was um, a nice healthy bull market. We had a nice healthy bull market run. Look how many times we have consolidations, you know, that pull back. This is healthy for the market. It rings out the excesses. Um, when we start getting towards a market top, you see we don't see so many consolidations anymore. And here's 2007. You know what happened over there. We uh, hit the market top. We're not seeing that kind of action um, recently that's ringing out the market excesses. If we look at the, uh, the S&P 500, we've had one pullback to, uh, to the fifth day moving average and pretty much a melt up here. And I'm a, very suspicious of this recent activity over here. Members from Wolf on Wall Street know why. 
Um, I use my proprietary 3C indicator over there, and um, they know what's going on with that. Now, since um, QE has has started, commodities have been driven up huge. Okay, so let's just take a look at um, the CRB index, and you can see again uh, very few corrections. Uh, we have one, two over here. Commodities have been driven up huge. Uh, Bernanke is maintaining, obviously, that um, the inflation rate is uh, subdued. It's uh, limits or, or what they're comfortable with. But you can clearly see that um, for any manufacturer's input costs have risen dramatically. Now, this is going to squeeze EPS. Um, there's going to be downward uh, revisions as the margins tighten. Not only that, but if you think about it, what these companies are trying to do is, is keep their uh, earnings looking good. Now, if margins are getting squeezed, what do you think they're going to do? They're either going to pass along price to consumers, so we have inflation, or they're going to let go of more employees, so we're going to have a higher unemployment rate. And if you look at the BLS numbers, they're just way, way off. I, I think uh, you can't count on them whatsoever. Uh, with the trickery that they're pulling and the adjustments and what whatnot, but uh, if you ever do look at the um, the BLS numbers, don't pay attention to uh, the U3 number. Go right to their site, look at U6. U6 is probably the best measure. It's how they counted um, unemployment during the Great Recession. It just jumped, by the way, in the last um, in the last report. And uh, even that, you know, people are saying that uh, unemployment. Is probably much higher. Probably the QE3 number is closer to 12%, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, U3 number is closer to 12%, and the U6 number is closer to 20%. So you're talking about one in five people either unemployed or underemployed. Inflation is being exported. Hot money flows are hitting emerging markets. We have trades at Wolf on Wall Street that are taking advantage of some of these trends. But, uh, re you know, what's going on in Egypt and recently um, Bernanke was asked if the Fed had any responsibility for events that are occurring um, in Egypt and uh, North Africa and throughout uh, all parts of the world where food riots and rampant inflation are uh, just running crazy. And, uh, you know, his answer was very smug and it seemed like he had never even considered the idea that um, quantitative easing has been responsible for exporting inflation and I think that we are going to see stealth inflation uh, because if you look at any of the PMI um, numbers that are coming out the headline numbers seem to look good but when you dig into the report you see consistently that the input costs are rising like what you're seeing here in the CRB index you know you can understand why we've had uh, I think a 150 year high in cotton sugar uh, I think it was near 30-year highs. Um, it's just it's just going crazy, and a lot of it's uh, food-oriented type of stuff, grains and and whatnot. I've been talking a lot about this and, and how emerging markets are going to try to protect themselves. Um, the uh, People's Bank of China just raised uh, their benchmark rate, two two benchmarks on uh, savings and lending by 25 basis points. That's the third time in a month. And uh, I've been saying the last couple of weeks at Wolf on Wall Street, mark my words, in February, China is going to raise rates. They're probably going to do it again next month. Um, Inflation is getting really hot there. And, and we see that in the food riots and the protests across the Middle East, Northern Africa, even parts of Europe. And this is a, a really dangerous situation because it's like the unintended consequences of political and economics and um a lot of times, you know, when we get these riots like we see in um, our protests, let's even just say peaceful protests, let's just say Egypt was peacefully protesting, what the protesters want and what they get are not at all the same thing. A great example of that is 1979, the Iranian Revolution. What the peaceful protesters wanted was not what they got when the Shah was kicked out and Islamic uh, extremist kind of state um, form.